Hello everyone, today we talk about the Carolingian Renaissance, or Renaissance if you prefer, or rather we'll give a brief look at it, brief for my standards as you know, um, but really, you know, scratching a little bit the surface and trying to frame uh, and to explain what actually the Renaissance, the Carolingian Renaissance practically was. Um, because uh, this term has been associated sometimes to let's say, mm, the development of the European continent during the Carolingian times, overall, like under kind of every aspect of of politics and society. But if you look at it in perspective, actually, it's not that Europe particularly grew or, you know, benefited greatly from the, uh, the development of the Carolingian Empire in itself, and especially with its end, which was definitely very violent, very uh, divisive uh, in many ways. But there is one factor that is uh, at the same time overlooked, because one, one thinks about the Franks and normally thinks in fact about war, about the empire, about this might, etc. But it was often overlooked and that actually makes uh, the Franks all the more interesting in the development of their, uh, of their vision of the empire and the, their political vision in general, is the cultural legacy of the Carolingian Empire. In other words, you know, if you look at, at it in perspective, um, well, actually, there was a consistent legacy of the Carolingian Empire, which wasn't much in its Carolingian nature in itself, but rather in the vassalatic beneficiary system that was the um, political and social system that was to, um, <clears throat> to modify the, uh, I mean, the, the face of Western Europe for, for centuries, actually even one millennium to come. Um, and, and this is an important legacy, of course, but you can, you know, say, well, but maybe there were other ways. I mean, especially if, uh, I mean, this is not necessarily an improvement, right? Um, we all know that the vassalatic beneficiary system brought, for instance, to a to a social stratification that, or vertization, if you prefer, where, you know, the, the wealth that in, in many areas of Europe, and this is more evident in, I don't know, in places like Saxony, etc., that were the tribal and uh, kind of rel very relatively egalitarian um, society that existed there was, was, was completely changed with, with, a, with a social engineering, um, brought to, to the impoverishment, in fact, of the average inhabitant of Carolingian Europe and, and, and post-Carolingian Europe. And this is actually true. It was a progressive transformation. Uh, it went far beyond, in fact, the Carolingian Empire. It's something that, if you want, had its even its more uh, its fullest consequences in, in modern Europe rather than in actual feudal Europe, um, <clears throat> especially this crystallization of the social classes during the, the Ancien Regime. It's, it's mostly a modern thing rather than a medieval one. The Carolingians set this in motion and you can observe that as, however, just a mm, a model of political and social organization that went beyond the, the empire in itself. The empire also survived, and this is another big legacy that went on. But you realize that an empire, for being worth of its name, had has to <coughs> to reach certain standards in many ways. What was the Carolingian Empire in terms of uh, power relatively to to the current situation in Europe was something that basically never gets restored until Napoleon in, in nature. Um, the, uh, I mean, not in nature, but in size and in, in actual power. Um, the medieval empire is often fragmented, is often <clears throat> is not able to, to extend, to project its power beyond certain, certain barriers that are not necessarily just geographical, but that never come to encompass all the territories, is extensionally speaking, that the original empire had been. Um, naturally, Europe grows in the meanwhile, and it's also often overlooked how the vassalatic beneficiary system was not this oppressive system that is often described um, in, in the measure in which it, 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 it was able to organize and rationalize also the um, the grow the the expansion of the European continent um, <clears throat> after the period after actually post Carolingian times the period of the second invasions uh, because also the rise of the cities and the trade activities etc was actually put in motion by the capitals of um, the seigneurial system that were shifted consistently 
Um, <coughs> excuse me, organize. Excuse me, I drink a little before we go on. <coughs> I hate when uh, after dinner I have you know, uh, this <laughs> recriminations. Um, <coughs> but um, I would argue that actually one, the biggest legacy in many ways that that went really at, at in in depth, especially in, in its culture base, was was in fact the let's say the educational one. You know that. The Carolingian Empire, we will see it now, had lots of problems, exactly because it didn't have a solid structure, after all. It, it was based, um, as many powers of the time, actually on military power. And this military power was was there as long as there, there was an expansion, as long as there was, the, the system could could be fed with external resources, that means through conquest and, uh, <clears throat> and invasion. Um, but when it overstretched, the, the the Franks turned basically on each other. They, they started to fight, and they effectively disintegrated the, the empire. So it's not excessively different from what happened to the Roman Empire, at least in, in perspective. Initially, um, <clears throat> with the crisis of the third century, etc. Um, now it, it's complicated. I, I've made several videos on the Franks in, in which I discuss this, this other topics in detail. But let's go look at what was the Carolingian Renaissance in itself, and observe how this was actually the only real qualitative improvement in, um, during the Carolingian times in terms of actually a positive effect out there. That naturally has to be contextualized and framed and. Um, and and this, I don't want this to be ideological. Perhaps in this premise I've been too um, oriented towards the idea of what I have ever the, the Carolingians done for us. This this is not truly really the point. I personally like very much um, <clears throat> the Carolingian Empire, especially the, the early Carolingians, um, and um, and and I definitely estimate the capacities of the Franks to to put a continent once again in motion. Mm -hmm. It was definitely not just their merit, because it was a system that we know was going to, to have a, um, a, repri a revival in some ways, and that would have um, expanded um, <clears throat> because of certain dynamics that were in intrinsic in the, in the, in the same fabric of, of the European society and uh, <clears throat> economic potential, etc. But the Franks really did, and especially the Carolingians, because this is something that started from the top, and it's particularly important, um, were able to leave a cultural legacy that was to inform, in fact, the uh, Western European culture um, in, <clears throat> very, in a very consistent way, and that was, was impressive. In my opinion, it's probably the greatest achievement of the Carolingians, so let's put it more positively in, in this perspective. Um, so, we um, <clears throat> one. Of, let's start from saying that one of the greatest, or perhaps the, the greatest concern of uh, Charlemagne, once that he had in fact extended the, the empire, these borders that were to remain effectively the ones um, of, of the empire, was um, the um, the creation of a responsible and reliable ruling class. This was perhaps the, the greatest concern because simply because um, the Carolingian Empire had not been born with a truly with a true ruling class aside from the one who bore arms and that now uh, as we have just said when when the borders were overstretched now was wanted just to share the cake within the the, the empire. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the Carolingian Empire had emerged as a great system of private clientels that started from the king went down the the, uh, the and it was extremely at the beginning especially it was very fluid i mean the comital class created by charlemagne was and by his predecessors was uh, from since especially charles uh, martel was definitely um a um, was was fluid was based actually on merit even the same idea of nobility was quite blurred in this let's say uh, Romano-Germanic Celtic world that <coughs> the Franks were were ruling on, with aristocracies that had already that were popping. Some of them were of actually of a very ancient origin that sometimes stemmed to, from the the original Gallo-Roman 
families or maybe from from the original Germanic conquest um, 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 conquerors. <coughs> Excuse me once again. Uh, but uh, by you know the the sheer military activity that the reconstruction of the empire during the eighth century entailed after the collapse of the kingdom uh, in the late Merovingian period basically had brought all these uh, noblemen from actually from from the very army uh, to to become uh, actually not noblemen but not only noblemen but also people who were maybe not even a freeman. This is particularly interesting. There is the case of certain Carolingian counts that actually obtained the comital title because they had been particularly effective in the army and who came from Vunio were. Just uh, I remind you that even before Carolingian times, um, the Gallo-Roman society was the the, the say in the Frankish world was very very much stratified. But at the same time, the Carolingians had brought to another to many ch other changes that you can see even sort of meritocracy, initially speaking. But these um, these people were whether whether uh, original aristocrats of older of old date, or um, you know um, new men, let's say rising through through the ranks during the military campaigns of the Franks, were only interested in personal power. Um, we, you can't stress enough how much the Frankish world consistently lacked any um, understanding of public authority, how the individual lordship was basically the, the whole world around which the, the mindset of these people revolved. Um, this was something that dated back to the original Let's say to the Romano-Germanic origins of, of the Frankish Empire, it, it, it was deeply rooted both into the, the Gallo-Roman senatorial elites and in the, <coughs> the Germanic uh, chieftains, and especially in the same Merovingian dynasty that, in this sense, considered the kingdom as a whole private uh, business, um, and the, the Carolingian partly inherited, um, and the. Um, and the problem is that at everybody in, in the lower ranks of society, lower echelons of society, believed basically the same thing in their own local space. This was the reality of Europe, of early medieval Europe. Uh, we, there is nothing. It, it was like living in a, in a world of mobsters. Um, <clears throat> every single society was basically a, uh, a clientelary society where there was the, 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 the powerful guy at the top who protected in, in exchange for hush money and <clears throat> that you can call tributes or taxes or whatever, but it was all in, in the hands of the privates, and the privates um, managed their business in their own fashion. Now, the problem of the Carolingians that now were kind of also more enlightened, but it, it true because they had risen consistently from the same the same background in many ways. And but at a certain point, especially when the empire gets so large, so they are starting to administer a huge amount of resources was really to find someone who could rule this um, this this empire with, with a certain degree of reliability. That's why uh, the the Carolingians uh, chiefly uh, started to to be su to 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 seek the support of the church because the church was effectively at this point the only permanent institution that, albeit very um, <clears throat> privatized in nature, and especially. In, in this central European lens, but however, was still something that was meant to remain. It was not just like a private domain that could be split among um, the male sons of every generation in the typical Frankish uh, fashion that brought to, to division, etc. The Carolingians were the, the best example of this. It's something that the Franks consistently never learned from from the origins of the Frankish kingdom to the, the very end. This idea that <coughs> every lord had Every uh, every um, male son had to to have an equal amount of 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 uh, inheritance from at his father's death is effectively the same reason why, by great part, also the Carolingian Empire collapsed, um, in in at least one of the major factors. Um, <clears throat> the late really Carolingians tried to obstacle this. In fact, even in the partition of the of, of the empire, you see that um, towards the end, <clears throat> the Carolingians, yeah. Keep splitting the the empire in large in 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 equal, I mean more or less equal parts. That, that and and they try to 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 carve other smaller entities 
um, the, for the, the lesser brothers, because by the way, the, the Frankish aristocracy, especially royalty, was now full of um, illegitimate sons. Was they were full of concubines that were, you know, actually very. <coughs> they were dealt with like um, like normal. Um, there, there wasn't this great social detachment for which everybody lived basically at court, and and this illegitimates were sometimes some of men of. I mean, individuals of great valor that had their, their, their saying, that they had their political importance, um, etc. Um, so, one of the major problems of the Carolingians now was to find um, a system to also administer this, this world that could overcome also the, the extreme um, <coughs> and the, um, cultural difference of the lands that they had conquered. I mean, this was an empire that literally stretched from northeastern Spain to the Baltic Sea and from the Mark of, of uh, uh, Bretagne to southern Italy. So this was a, a, um, a really big thing, and the, 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 the lands, the, the peoples that, that the empire encompassed were also quite diverse, quite different. Um, it's from this diversity that actually the Carolingians, and we will see now, drew um, the kind of the best elements away available, some of the best personnel, some of the best uh, models, uh, in many ways, uh, for centralizing the empire. There, there is a great, especially um, a great um, Im imitation of the uh, Romano-Mediterranean models, right? Especially the ones of the Church, once again, that uh, that in Southern Europe was also, you know, assisted by you know much more educated and skilled personnel, had much more centralized. Um, institutions and administrations um, <clears throat> that the the Carolingians now understood that they they could ideally import in, in the north. So to to put an end of this um, 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 this uh, centrifugal uh, force that uh, tended was was pushing for for the effectively for the collapse of the same empire as it would happen. So. You know, too late, yeah, because the the you can uh, you can argue that this uh, this system could have not worked in the north that there were effectively no pre-existing structures to consolidate a kind of a central power or anything, and it's it's true actually, but there was still an effort on a especially at the administrative level to um, <clears throat> to push for a, a certain degree of uh, uniformity of homogeneity. Um, and in the administration, definitely one of the most important and one of the key factors is communication and the training of the personnel. Um, so the uh, you cannot say that the, the Carolingians began in, in in a way to to solve the problem um, by um, <coughs> um, recurring to institutions that the political culture of the moment had elaborated. Um, and this def definitely wind widened the, uh, the 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 perspectives, let's say, the horizons of the imperial project in many ways. The Carolingians started to develop at the time from 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 Charlemagne chiefly um, a a real cultural program that um, was um, was based on the. Um, concretization of certain the realization of certain initiatives that had its, its pivotal center in the Scola Palatina, that is the school of, of palace. Um, <clears throat> this was essentially an ac academy that was born um, in the court of Aachen, hmm? of A La Chapelle, if you prefer, um, that was effectively meant to be the capital of the empire. Hmm? Uh, that Charlemagne, in fact, had built. Um, as a as another Rome, the model was Rome definitely because you know the, the Franks were obsessed with Romanity, with the the the, 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 cl the classical world, not just with that. Actually, the the greatest model the Franks were using at this time were were the Jews was the Old Testament. The the Franks at this time were deeply convinced that they were a chosen people, just like the Jews and the Romans had been. Um, Charlemagne was in love with the Old Testament, with the bloodsheds in it, with, with warfare, because it also provided much more, actually, than the, the New Testament, this military dimension that the Franks were so fond of, because arguably the Franks were all about war. That, that was the older perspective. <coughs> 
excuse me, once again. Um, but they, um, I don't know where I was going with this. Uh, oh yeah, that the that Aachen was built effectively as a, as a at least with, with Rome in, in in the Frankish mind. Um, although also in here, uh, it, it can be a detail, but it's still meaningful to to explain better this. I mean, if you look at Aachen, this was meant to be a capital, right? Like Rome had been. Now Rome, even in in this situation of of early medieval times, was was a true city. Actually, it was one of the largest cities. Was I believe the lar still the la the largest city in the West. Um, it was consistently, you know, it had this urban tradition. It was a, a large system. It was a center of culture. Um, that emanated, in fact, all this great um, personnel and, and cultural production, and etc. Um, and it was a real city, right? In, in Northern Europe, this didn't quite exist as such. I mean, especially in in Neustria, in the in the Gallic lands, let's say, of the empire, you you had this consistent uh, Roman tradition, more in the center, in the south, actually, than than in the north of France, where where the, the Francia, the Western Francia, were properly was, or now so I'd say better probably was, um, and had more or less its cities. But even in, during Frankish times, uh, even though the, the, the Merovingians, later the, Car uh, the Carolingians, immediately kind of settled into the cities because that was their center of power, they effectively never managed to, to control much from there. I mean, these cities were um, just kind of logistical bases. They didn't have a truly... Um, Paladin function can say uh, in terms of a administrative center. The the Franks didn't have this traditional um, uh, Roman uh, the, uh, this Roman traditional way of, of, of administration. The uh, the Visigoths had had the um, the Longobards. Even the Longobards had had. Um, the, the Franks didn't. The Franks functioned on the base of clientels with centers of power that actually shifted. The courts were itinerant. Even the Anglo-Saxons actually, in already at this time, had a, a you know a, a true capital um, with with a chance or with, with with a center of power. Um, that also because naturally Britain was smaller. The the, the Anglo-Saxon dominions were kind of more compact. But the 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 the, the general idea is that the, the Frankish perspective had lacked this idea of, of a true center of power. So that Aachen, albeit remaining one of the you know most uh, famous cities of the Middle Ages, never quite became a true capital. Um, the the core the Frankish courts were always itinerant. They, they uh, also the, the the Merovingians used to live in this great uh, country mansions, uh, where also they, they got effectively exiled and confined, even by the same Carolingians. So this idea of of centralization, you can understand, was was could not quite function in the in the political and social fabric of of, of the north. And this myth of recreating an empire, a Roman empire, in the north was effectively going to. To, to vanish, or at least to to achieve a, a much more mystical dimension, eventually, especially also from an intellectual point of view, uh, on, under Ottonian times. The Franks, uh, in this, never quite even elaborate, the Carolingians especially, they, they didn't quite um, elaborate a, a true uh, legitimization of power. Actually, the, the same imperial ideal was something more... Um, was it was still pretty vague in Carolingian times. It was it was assumed, but also the romanity of this title was something that, that mostly started developing in in the Ottonian times, when there was effectively, and we have talked about this uh, about a sort of uh, Ottonian Renaissance in turn. They started to look more thoroughly, more systematically to ancient sources to back their own imperial prerogatives, chiefly against the Byzantines in Carolingian times. The, uh, because now the Ottonians were involved into Italy, they intermarried also with the Byzantines, etc. But in Carolingian times, there was still this largely uh, central European, rural, and most mostly Germanic dimension that had a, a very different conception of power, um, and that was still to 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 be agglutinated around uh, uh, around a a concept of. Um, a, a mystical concept, or uh, let's say a, a um, um, politically theoretical um, concept of of empire, of Roman Empire, actually. Even though the the ascent, I mean, the feelings were were still there, especially 
um, from the elites. Um, I stress the elite, then the concept, especially that this, the Carolingian Renaissance started from from the elite, because it's not something that that happens very often. If you look at even at lower medieval times and other uh, dynamics that occurred in the meanwhile, actually, the the major European achievements were were starting from from the lower strata of the population. Think about the recovery of Roman law, trade, craftsmanship, even even the Renaissance. I mean, they're all something that were um, maybe catalyzed by the elites, but were rarely, you know, uh, socially, engineeringly produced um, by by the, the elites and then falling down. And the Carolingians were one of the few sovereigns that achieved, in fact, if not the only ones in some way. I mean, to, in, in the way that they did, at least proportionally, to create a, an educational model that was to survive, in fact, in the administration, in generally speaking, in the uh, uh, culture of Europe, chiefly the ecclesiastical culture of Europe, but from there actually spreading into the lay, um, into the lay world, uh, pretty, pretty soon actually, and unavoidably, that was to last. Uh, in fact, as we've said before, for for a millennium, and and to give to Europe a much more homogeneous, and actually. Um, um, uh, I, I stress homogeneous in the sense uh, uh, of a European system. Mm -hmm. There is this idea, of, for instance, of Charlemagne, father of Europe. Now, this is a very bold concept that has been profitably criticized because you know Europe uh, at this time basically wasn't wasn't conceived any other than than a geographical dimension. There was there wasn't a really a true European conscience. Uh, it was something much more. Uh, you know, it was yet to, to come. The, the concept of modern Europe is something you can start to 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 observe from from just the low Middle Ages, but especially in the modern age, and also in there there are many variations and swingings, etc. But um, at this time, the perspective was still very much universalistic in many ways and didn't much take into consideration a certain part part of land, geographically speaking. Because the empire that these powers were trying to reach was universal, it had to encompass the whole world, it had to be an ecumenic power. So also the models naturally that were produced in Carolingian times were trying to head toward that direction and getting inspired directly from the source of old universalism. There was indeed Rome um, and the papacy, especially in this case, because um, the papacy was effectively the depository of the Roman legacy from a cultural point of view in the West, at least. Uh, naturally, the Byzantine influence was equally important because definitely the Franks began to, at a certain point, uh, you know, uh, they, to, to interact with more thoroughly with the Byzantines to, to pose uh, themselves the problem of being actually something equal to them, albeit th this was... Um, as emperors, at least that that was developed actually later, but uh, it was something that the Franks had had always kind of looked, um, uh, had always thought that they could uh, aspire to be, but they had never quite reached that the, the the dimension of a power, uh, the the power dimensions that could make them equal to to the Byzantines at this point. Well, in Carolingian times, this started occurring. So, it's a series of factors that start to intervene in this relatively, you know, rough and, by the way, illiterate culture. When we talk about the Carolingian Empire, we have to think that uh, the Franks were ignorant as goats, right? That there was only one thing that the Franks knew how to do well, that it was war. And, they, they, and that was arguably the only thing they were capable of doing. Uh, the Carolingians understand that in order to rule such a big empire, they, they have to form something, uh, some institutions, some administration that has to work, aside from just the military power that was, so, that was confined unavoidably into the hands of privates. So if the empire had some chances to survive, these were recognized by the Carolingians into the creation of some administrative system that being possible, let's say, to to spread with 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 to impose with force it could be, however, spread through through literacy, through culture, through education, through certain models, and effectively, um, uh, this th this didn't wasn't really born only out of a abstract um, uh, ideal that the Carolingians started from from Charlemagne, especially because that's where where it began, started to 
to to transpire to just for for the sake of their glory stuff like that did this this guy really had a huge problem it was really controlling half of Europe um, uh, really in terms also think about the logistics uh, of the armies etc of all the the, the, the recruitment system etc this required necessarily more literacy more education people who could handle you know accounts who could calculate who could write who could who could read definitely and and to um, this is why the the famous uh, missi dominici were effectively one it was one was a lord was a was a military man was a count usually the other one was a clergyman and they had to comfort each other's uh, role basically and the clergy was uh, deeply involved into the system because uh, albeit being still part in the frankish world this of those private families, however, they received some some sort of education, and we know that before the the Carolingian uh, reforms in education, in fact, the, the Frankish clergy was extremely ignorant. I mean, they couldn't even read Latin, so they they misread the Bible in the most absurd ways, and and this was actually a big problem also for the concerns, the religious concerns of of this empire. This was aspiring to to be actually the 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 Roman Empire and all the empire. So. And the Franks actually did this for way more pragmatic reasons you can imagine. They actually believed in still a kind of a um, you know in a world that was halfway between uh, paganism and Christianity. That I don't know. The more priests prayed for the 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 wealth of the empire, for the for the salvation of the empire, and the more God would effectively help the empire to, to survive itself. So there were even this kind of very pragmatic concerns that even from an ideological point of view were seen as you know functional to the survival um, of the empire. Now what what is extremely fascinating uh, about this system that I hinted at before is the European dimension of it. Because the Carolingians didn't use um, you know, um, they, they needed scholars to uh, activate this uh, educational reform, um, and um, the, uh, the you you might expect you know that you know most of these scholars, at least the most famous ones, were were Franks on their own. Instead, they weren't, and not only they weren't Franks, but they were even uh, scholars that came outside the Frankish um, the, the the Frankish Empire in itself. Um, we see, for instance, uh, the most famous one of, of these well, was the Anglo-Saxon Alcuin of York, uh, Alwine, I believe it, that's a, a, his uh, original name, and uh, he, he was born in York in 735 and died in Tours uh, in 1804, and um, his teaching, in this case, was uh, definitely inspired to the um, n not... Uh, not by chance, I mean in the sense of, of the role that naturally um, was uh, for which Alcuin was 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 introduced into the Frankish uh, court uh, was inspired to the re rediscovery of the classical culture. Mm -hmm. So his teaching based on classical culture became the fundament for the reorganization of the school system of all the Carolingian Empire contributing uh, decisively to the Carolingian Renaissance. Um, he, uh, Alcuin was, as we have seen, uh, an Anglo-Saxon. He, he had spent his youth in the famous school of York that also in, in this British um, environment where, you know, w w was developing, the, I mean, all these centers of culture. Uh, he was first attracted by poetry uh, he went a first time uh, in Rome searching for books for, for the library of his own school. So this is also interesting to see that this um, European system was setting in motion, let's say, even the, the exchange of, um, you know, the, the, of, of culture, of knowledge, of ideas, is, was something that was already effectively working in the early Middle Ages. The idea that books in the Middle Ages were not used, were not read, were just stored, is just a uh, you know a, a, a brutal approximation. It's, it's not really true, um, and um, the the clergy has always has not just treasured, has also expanded, has also exported, and made circulating thoughts, ideas, 
uh, manuscripts, etc. And but then Alcuin came back to um, to to Britain and uh, in his school and he in uh, in 708. Then eventually was invited because of his uh, you know of qualities of scholar in in Francia where he uh, reconstituted actually what uh, in 781 the Scola Palatina that we have met before. And according to the custom um, <laughs> introduced by by himself, Alcuin uh, wanted to be called in the Roman way. Uh, his name in Latin was Flaccus Albinus, <laughs> right? Um, which uh, which is particularly um, interesting. And the um, in, in proof of this reborn love for classical uh, literature. And he he was to to leave basically this mark uh, forever in this uh, reborn um, uh, classical research in in in, in Europe, and um, also Alcuin believed pretty uh, as we've seen pretty mm, pretty long for those time standards actually, and he um, he was a teacher for two generations right he inspired the rear the, the school reorganization of the empire and um, he also um, administered several abbeys um, and the most important one uh, from uh, 796 was Tours where he uh, created this new uh, this precious library and a new school so what is interesting about these figures is that as they um, they they were effectively uh, involved into uh, the spread of culture, uh, uh, locally speaking, not just uh, from a center, but actually starting to operate in this very various abbatial um, um, centers, um, re uh, reshaping or reconstructing the lo local libraries, enriching them with new with new works, etc., in teaching. And therefore, spreading ideas, um, and this was was particularly um, important. Um, uh, now we don't have time to, to tell all the the, the works that Albu Alcuin wrote, but definitely there were several um, poems, uh, epigrams, um, um, and the the tri uh, actually even treatises on the liberal arts, on grammar, rhetorics, dialectics. Um, the there, there were also several disputes that he wrote down. He wrote about music. Uh, he actually um, introduced the eight musical tones. Um, the uh, another aspect that definitely he he wrote also a lot about theology, as it's uh, understandable. Um, the um, he revised even the the Volgata Latina actually. That in this sense was known um, as the the Alcuinian text, as it was revived. He wrote about philosophy. Uh, he disserted on the Trinity, on certain uh, you know on certain heresies, um, and he um, and there are even three hundred important letters, um, including one written to Charlemagne himself, um, in um, into which he actually um, fixed the principles that inspired from Frankish side the imperial proclamation of the sovereign. Uh, he wrote about maths um, and th th this was all very relevant work at the time. Um, the, 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 he also re critically reviewed the uh, Gregorian sacramentary. Um, it, it, it's a very fascinating uh, Alcuin is also very fascinating because as an individual uh, for his interests and, and, and ideas um, other great thinkers. So, and he was Anglo-Saxon. He was not a subject of the empire. He came effectively from a land that had not been encompassed by by the Carolingian conquests, and that, however, uh, was in contact with this world. Was in contact with with Carolingian empire. Was in contact with Rome, as we've seen. The Anglo-Saxons had very long and, and strong contacts with, uh, with with the papacy. Um, 
and uh, so this voice, a European system, was setting itself in in motion in many ways. Um, another great um, scholar that definitely uh, that that in in this uh, came actually from in, instead within lands that were conquered by the Franks because he came from from the Longobard kingdom was. Paul the Diacon, uh, also one of the great um, minds uh, of the time. Um, his name in Latin was Paulus uh, Diaconus. He, actually, his Longobard name was Barnefred, um, and he was born in uh, Cividale of Friuli uh, between uh, 720-724 and died in the Abbey of Monte Cassino. Uh, uh, we think uh, Mm, right before I think the year 800 or rough like that something like that and uh, he actually uh, came from a noble Longobard family uh, he was also relatively involved politically his brother led uh, actually a rebellion against Charlemagne that seemingly even had put the, the, the empire in quite some difficulty but eventually he came to to work for the Franks right where the system was the the the, the Italic kingdom was framed into the Carolingian borders and um Paul was a uh, first monk of the um the the monastery of um uh, Civate close to Como Lake and then eventually in uh, in Monte Cassino um, and uh, we we don't know much about his life actually, but that he followed some of the highest uh, entourage uh, of the time. He probably entered in in Monte Cassino uh, together with the um, uh, with the Longobard king uh, Ratkis, um, and the um, and after the fall of the Longobard kingdom at the hand of the Franks, he entered in contact with Charlemagne in order to obtain the actually the, the liberation of his own brother that the hand rebelled as we've said before eventually he lived at the frankish court returning to monte cassino around 786 um the um his works are best known one is the storia romana which is, is a roman history composed perhaps before 774 um, that was inspired to to Eutropius and partly also kind of its um, continuation. Um, then the uh, Gesta Episcoporum uh, Metensium, that um, actually stemmed from a from other uh, episcopal chronicles uh, of the time. And um, but as mostly and especially the, the most famous Historia Langobardorum, so the history of the Longobards that is one of the m uh, most important works of the whole early Middle Ages um, that uh, tells actually the, the, his the very vivid history of his own people, um, written with 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 intensity of feelings, but also freshness that add also kind of an epic tone, but still uh, a very very important source for the uh, understanding of, of that of those times of the previous centuries and um and it, it, this is particularly interesting because this was not just a pure classicist who wrote on the base of sources but it, it added oral traditions to that so um the, the longbirds had very strongly this feeling of their their origins their their traditions and uh, the 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 memory of their past was still pretty pretty much alive at that time um and uh and probably um in the historia longobardorum uh polydiacon uh, in inserted some some uh, information that was lost from a um that today this today is lost because it belonged to a historical work from secundus of trent uh second uh, uh, secundus of non also no um, and um, we we think that the Historia Langobardorum what was actually written um, for the Franks, which is particularly interesting because it actually talks. Uh, it doesn't. It stops basically before the. Uh, it stops with the, the the kingdom of of Lutbrand, that had been the the, the acme of power of the Longobards. Um, and uh, and before the catastrophes with the uh, that came with the Frankish conquest, the, the wars with the Franks, etc. So 
on the base of this and other hints, we, the, it's be, being believed that the same Franks, the same Carolingians, commissioned this work also to kind of give the the Longobards the prize and the the the, the excuse me the the, the restoring the, the lost honor that the defeat basically had brought on this people. But it was definitely uh, important because the Carolingians always had an enormous care of the Italic kingdom. They they didn't abolish when they conquered. Charlemagne himself assumed the title of King of the Franks and of the Longobards, so this was not a title that you know was acquired for for other peoples because the Franks actually uh, uh, considered the Longobards that they're only peers in Europe and they estimated their, their especially the Germanic traditions very very much. Um, but now times were evidently changing, and the Franks also had a consistent Roman, um, uh, let's say. Uh, obsession <laughs> in imperial terms and uh, something that, that now was in fact really bring, bring to, to the conquest of other peoples and having to deal with this um, very different tradition from the old, the, the old Germanic one um, and um, there are also here other things we could tell about Paul the Deacon but here we have an, here are yet another element this one from 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 Italy, the other one was from Britain. Um, so you see, two scholars that came from this other direction. Um, another very important figure, uh, still from 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 uh, from Italy actually, um, and from the same milieu of Paul the Diacon actually, was the, the uh, Paulinus of uh, Aquileia. This was another important scholar of the Carolingian court. Um, he was a bishop from uh, and and eventually became patriarch of uh, Aquileia here um, in, in the northeast. Uh, we're we're still talking about the the northeast uh, of Italy, so the same actually as we're saying the same areas from which Paul the Deacon um, came from, and he he was another witness of the collapse of the of the Longobard kingdom under the the, the Carolingian conquest, but he collaborated. Uh, as we've seen with with uh, with Charlemagne, and um, especially uh, he, he uh, seemingly stayed at the Frankish court for ten years, between 777 and 787, where he was come to uh, he was called to to in fact um, uh, to to the patriarchal throne after the death of the previous of the previous patriarch. And um, he was definitely an intellectual of his times. He operated uh, several liturgical reforms. Uh, he composed certain religious and as well as uh, secular, let's say, uh, poetry. Uh, he was keen on music. Um, and um, similarly to Alcuin, he fought against certain... Um, for adoption, a Spanish adoptionism that that had been criticized also in one of the works of, of Alcuin of York um, and he also produced uh, certain theological works on his own uh, and um, uh, he um, he eventually um, also participated to certain councils a work called uh, by the same Carolingians at this um, at this uh, purpose uh, of denouncing um, heresy, the one of, of Regensburg in 792 and the one of Frankfurt in 794 and um, because exactly of the, to, to contrast the ad um, adoptionism of Elipan, Olipan, uh, Elipandus of, of Toledo, that was this archbishop of um, uh, Toledo that had sustained at, at the time, actually uh, Elipandus was born uh, was uh, died in the in the in the ninth uh, at the beginning of the ninth century, so he was a contemporary of Charlemagne. In this in in, in this sense, it's fascinating that the, the Franks were actually taking uh, into consideration the uh, also the the ecumenic role of the uh, you know the of their church to counter the heresies and also to counter the heresies of this area of the Iberian Peninsula that had remained kind of op opposite uh, in, in opposite. To, to the Church of Rome, and now the, the Carolingians were were effectively uh, protecting uh, and deriving their imperial title from. 
and interestingly enough, Paulinus of Aquileia also um, sent certain missionaries to to Christianize the neighboring uh, people of the Avars before the, the the Franks came to 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 crush them and uh, and Christianized the, the remains forcibly, the relics forcibly. And um, and he uh, and before becoming patriarch, Paulinus was also magister grammaticus at the Palatine School of Charlemagne, um, and um, cooperating, working together with Alcuin o of York. So here you have this this uh, meeting between um, other European scholars that were effectively working. Uh, not just altogether for the same for the same power, but also, I mean, exchanging ideas and producing poets, etc. And um, yeah, uh, another fascinating figure in here is Theodulfus or Theodul Theodulf of Orléans, mm -hmm. and um, it, sometimes he's co he's known actually as uh, Theodulf the uh, the Visigoth. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, he was probably uh, Spanish, but uh, some say that he could be also of Italian origin. And he was called, however, into Francia uh, by Charlemagne himself in order to uh, cooperate to the revival of the of the studies. So uh, Theodolf was soon elected uh, by the emperor uh, Abbot of Fleury. And in uh, perhaps in 786 became Archbishop of Orléans. So these was were actually important um, ecclesiastical seats at the time. And um, and Theodulf is particularly important because he founded a great number of schools. Um, he was a, an, a he was fundamentally a poet. Um, he was an extremely refined and elegant poet uh, in Latin, of course. And um, and also among the first of his times, because actually uh, poetry in er, uh, you know up to that point had been relatively marginalized because the, the general uh, intellectual uh, mainstream considered as frivolous or unnecessary the idea of uh, producing a kind of poetry for just for you know why, why don't you study the Bible that's all you should be doing well you see that. Um, under in, during the Carolingian Renaissance, there is also um, a problem actually posed by this new, uh, if you want, secular uh, dimension of, of literature of art that, that develops and that looks also in this more. Uh, I wouldn't say. Uh, I don't know what term is is better, but probably joyful. Let's say in happy and and pleasure seeking. A view of life, and that naturally was stigmatized, especially by the most conservative uh, thinkers. But nevertheless, Theodolfo was also a theologian, a preacher, an apologist, and he is um, to be considered one of the most uh, zealous, uh, zealous promoters of the Carolingian Renaissance. Um, he outlived Charlemagne, and, and he obtained actually the favor of Louis the Pius. Um, uh, albeit only for for a short time, because he was um, eventually suspected to have encouraged the the movement of Bernard, who was king of Italy at this time, that was deposed um, and was deposed by from all the uh, the the offices and all the titles. It was, it was made prisoner, and actually, eventually he was absolved, and uh, he died in Angers on September the twenty eighth. 821. Um, the the um, Theodolf has been important chiefly f for his Carmina, as we have said, his poetry, uh, poetic compositions, but he also wrote a, a book of capitularies f um, for, um, for his own clergy, actually. Uh, these were all clergymen, so this is what uh, European culture is mostly, but the clergymen would effectively by approximation, the only illiterate uh, people at the time, or at least especially in Northern Europe, and uh, therefore the it would be normal that this this also for for the lifestyle that they had actually uh, a consistent part of Carolingian clergy was involved into the craft of, of the yeah of craft of arms. Telling the truth, there were many abbots and bishops that died sword in hand at this time. 
including certain including certain um, uh, relatives of of, of uh, the royal the, the imperial family. Um, but this was the the ecclesiastical uh, milieu was effectively the one where, where culture was most being deployed, exchanged, etc. And um, he uh, Tudor also wrote a treatise on ceremonies and other uh, several other works actually um and he also uh, was called by charlemagne to parti to take part into the theological disputes of the time um relative to the uh, procession of the holy spirit because of the the, the filioque problem that that was something maybe we'll see another time um so you see in here basically we have one Englishman, one Italian and one Spanish, perhaps or actually two Italians and, and one Spanish. And so you see that um this um scholars come from uh different areas of the empire. They come to work in the same place, to study in the same places, to to have a fortune into this empire, to this ecclesiastical system that the same Carolingians were trying to reinforce and to structure and therefore spreading different views, different perspectives about their own world, but that at the same time they came all together for the same, kind of the same, the same purpose, the same goal. And, and thanks to these characters, uh, Charles Main, uh, Charlemagne, I'd say better, uh, Charles Main can't be heard, Sh Charlemagne uh, court came um, to, to be a uh, place of elaboration of ecclesiastical culture, from which would have stamped not only the the reform of the Frankish Church, but also the uh, new uh, scholastic organization, the new school organization. So the uh, exponents of this cenaculum didn't just work for the political um, and religious unity of the military conquered uh, world of Charlemagne, but also they were aspiring to the creation of a um, common system of language and of education that could uh, provide the clergy with the necessary tools to uh, carry out adequately the role that uh, belonged to the, the, the task that they had in the government of the state. So uh, not just ideal problems, not just intellectual problems, but actually uh, pretty pragmatic problems that were naturally all intertwined because they n definitely required a theoretical um, you know a theoretical elaboration in order to organize this this reform and this uh, ambitious project that as we said before however was successfully carried out and outlived the same Carolingian empire for forever basically um, as we still write <laughs> with the Carolingian script today so it, it's not a very you know this has not to be given for granted so the activity of such intellectuals was uh you know uh, carried out at several levels as we've seen so at, at the carolingian court um there was prevalently the, the the starting of the christian and classical texts that were considered as masters of style and re uh, re reflection, let's say. And this created a fervid production of codes, of works, that were uh, oriented to preserve the ancient culture, right? And, and thanks to this, several works of the classical world have come up, up to us, because this was also work of research, of of um of transcription so this effectively brought several uh several works to to be um not just left there forgotten or to 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 decay even for the same uh, material support over which they were written but they were effectively copied and re uh, replicated and spread and read and copied again and uh and definitely also with with kind of uh some um Philological improvement in the process because um, the uh, studying these books naturally equated also to um, be able to it, it entailed to be able to to know Latin at a certain level and also to 
to educate other others on the base of this kind of more uh, this proper Latin, where the the purpose of uh, reading classical authors wasn't just historical or political, but it was in fact as meant as an exercise. I mean, looking at at, at the fontes, uh, like it said in Latin, that is uh, looking straight at the source in uh, uh, and the spring of, of of classical Latin, and therefore how it was allegedly supposed to be um, to be studied. Uh, from another side, you find the the uh, the promotion of a new school organization with the multiplication of schools and libraries, uh, actually in in the local monasteries and bishoprics, because these were uh, were the the, sco the, the schools. So usually, it was it was the cathedral school or in the monastery. Um, so these were usually the uh, the two places where you could find library and uh, teaching, etc. Um, and, and these centers were to remain actually uh, the centers of cultural um, re-elaboration and at the same time the pivot for the circulation of ideas within the whole imperial territory. Now this is particularly important because um, I even if you look that in, in, uh, in temporal perspective you see that with the collapse of the Carolingian Empire you have the, the political power uh, crumbling, right? Uh, vanishing, fragmenting, uh, etc. But effectively, the, the net of uh, monasteries, of dioceses, they were newly founded. I mean, at this time, the empire had expanded into areas that had not known Christianity, so that there were new bishoprics being founded, etc. So the the survival actually of this system. So actually, it was the Carolingian Church, the element that that survived the most, and that was substantially untouched. Of course, during the second invasions, monasteries and churches suffered heavily from the the pagan raids and also because they were very wealthy centers um, and they were effectively very profitable to loot. But they survived. They they managed to compartmentalize their their, their wealth to, to escape, to, to form this net of communication. I mean, if you look in post carolingian times, what effectively kept Europe together from a cultural point of view, from a communicational point of view, m more than else, were effectively the monasteries, were effectively the bishoprics, because these were standing. You know, the Carolingians had seen it right. I mean, they, they hadn't, uh, hadn't made it to, to save the, the secular branch, but they had understood that the ecclesiastical one was actually a very strong... Uh, strongly rooted and and steady um, uh, net of power that that could be profitably exploited to to make something to create something long lasting. Okay, um, this is this is particularly important. Um, so that culture spread uh, even in the darkest hour of the invasion, etc. Books, manuscript kept circulating, kept being spread. People kept reading, kept researching kept transcribing, kept studying, and, and this created a homogeneous culture into Europe. When you hear the, the Charlemagne, father of Europe, sometimes it's, it's referred to this kind of uh, relatively political and military ideal, but it, if you look at it from a strictly cultural perspective, Okay, it was not just Charlemagne, where the Carolingians in there, but they effectively made it at this point to create this system that strongly unified Europe. And this passed chiefly also through the creation of the Carolingian script. Or the, um, the, the, the yeah, the minuscola. That as also called, uh, th that it would be the small letter, the, the lower, lower case letter, as I could say today, more kind of digital fashion. But to make you understand wh what you're talking about, because the capital letters were effectively copied by the Roman epigraphy. Um, so this very big squared picture said the 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 small letter uh, that we see now, where, where it was taken from, was the one that we still use today. In fact. Um, and this was one of the most powerful mean, um, most powerful means of communication ever invented at the time, ever invented in general, actually, um, because um, the this 
the usage of this new uh, script wasn't actually just coming from the ecclesiastical reform. It was something that was being revived, uh, or at least it it didn't just directly come from there. It, it passed through it, but it, it also was required effectively for a an effective administration, right? You you need to 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 write something that can be profitably read by people who who, who live, uh, you know, thousands of kilometers away, that are, however, still part of the same empire, and that have to understand what you have written. So you have to to be uh, to be understood. Um, the um, so this um, this also passed because the the, the Carolingians started to implement actually especially from Charlemagne onwards um, a very um, solid uh, l um, legal production. Um, this is important because we have seen that it's, it's effectively with Charlemagne that this idea of creating an educational reform really started you know the predecessors had definitely dealt with um, with administrative problems but at the same time they had they had been more like uh, involved into into warfare into expanding the empire keeping it uh, you know the, in in this sense being just military men charlemagne was definitely uh, a military man in himself he was not a, an extremely educated he was definitely not an educated person but he during his life he got particularly um fascinated with with culture with latin uh, he tried his best to learn it we know from his uh, biographer that he allegedly had his you know uh, ta uh, you know uh, uh, say latin exercises under under the pillow um, even when he w when he was in bed because he wanted really to to, sp to to study to learn because he thought that he could gain basically a higher knowledge a higher um that that higher um meanings could could be revealed to them just thinking that this was a world that was as we said before was not acquainted with 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 written culture and that still that that didn't have a uh, kind of a rationalized or a secularized approach to it. Um, this was a word that was effectively um, not very distant from paganism. People consistently behaved in, 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 in all the supernatural, but even as a kind of a still hybrid way, not just theologically speaking, but to uh, even the local superstitions, etc. And, and the written letter owned a kind of a magic uh, meaning in some way. The, the letter was not seen like today just as a, a, as a mere medium. Um, he was effectively thought that th there was some truth and, 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 and power, at least, or, um, uh, within the same letters that effectively could, could uh, grant knowledge and power. It was true also, in, if you think about the runes in the, um, in the northern world uh, with the with this m magic meanings attached to them that were also not entirely um, you know the, 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 they had a, a meaning that went beyond the mere script actually the, the mere ma the linguistical meaning that was attached to it but this is um, uh, yeah so this is what the the Britain um, dimension was seen like, and at the same time was increasingly needed. So, the especially with all the capitularies that were starting being produced by Charlemagne, by his successors, who now had, in fact, expanded the empire, and that they had need to keep to keep it together, all in, in one piece, preferably, um, which they failed to do over time. But nevertheless, it was seen that that the for the spread of laws of capitularies. Well, definitely the bettering of education and the spread of a common script were, were necessary to, to, uh, to make their laws being obeyed and to be, to be understood in the first place because laws were uh, at this time also not so um, just, uh, you know, abs abs abstract. I mean, that if you look at the Carolingian, if you read the Carolingian capitularies, you realize that they had a very strong pragmatic nature. So the message was really to to be understood it wasn't just an an abstract um you know a legal a juridical category that that had to be figured out through this thing no the 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 the, the, 
the laws at this time were written in Germanic tradition in very very simple manner you know were actually a list of prescriptions that had to be understood and also were with an ex explanation etc so um, naturally these words were were these laws were written in Latin um, and uh, the idea of a common script was also something uh, I don't like the term revolutionary but objectively was kind of a big thing at this time because the nobody at this time it wasn't a common script at this time in Europe there was nothing like that these characters uh, had to be read by everyone so if you look at all the various Latin Germanic kingdoms that had formed after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West in every region basically had elaborated his own system of signs that were sometimes so different one from the other to compromise the intelligibility of texts outside of this specific territorial um, uh, you know area so the new script uh, had to uh, to surpass this to create a uh, a common model once again uh, this is interesting because in during the Roman Empire there had been effectively a uh, homogeneity script so this these scripts didn't actually uh, come out of the blue they had still developed from the ancient Roman cursive fundamentally so and and that's what the Carolingians went back and lo looking at um, because in order to base themselves uh, for creating the new script they they went looking at this ancient uh, uh, um, uh, this old uh, lower, uh, this old uh, small letters, let's say, that had been handed down through the codes of chiefly 4th, 5th century, that had been the ones who had been mostly preserved and, and transcribed in the monastic centuries, uh, centers. Um, the majority of classical texts were lost. We, we actually, we, we of the actually. Uh, none of the texts but uh, of the actual manuscripts were lost like we normally have most of the of the with the stuff we have uh, surviving is from the lower uh, from the uh, from the lower centuries also um, because uh, books now were written in a different way paradoxically it was the 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 absence let's say the decline in in, in literacy and in writing that brought into the lower and uh, to the late empire to to produce books that were more um, more resistant over time because in imperial times uh, everybody you know uh, population on average was substantially literate and uh, therefore the the supports for writing were also kind of cheaper because you know the practice was there that it was not a big deal to 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 store to treasure manuscripts because they were effectively easy to copy there was also the the, the material etc towards the fourth century a lot of changes uh, by the way the the there is the member nations manuscript that starts being used because in fact it was more resistant because the book doesn't it's, it's not read anymore but it's just treasured like even as a, as a say status symbol object right so this paradoxically uh, equated to a much lower literacy uh, I mean it was a consequence of a much lower literacy but still there were more books that uh, were uh, were you know the books were more easily preservable at least the, the few ones that, that were there um, so in Carolingian times they they looked at these books and they didn't have at the time the the polygraphical and codicological skills to understand that these were effectively not the ancient Roman um, were not re written with the ancient Roman script but it was actually a late Roman script nevertheless they thought that this is how they, they wrote at the time of Cicero and they copied this because they thought that it was the, the script using in the Roman Empire so now the Carolingians had a reborn Roman Empire from their perspective what other script did they have to use? they had to, to use the Roman one this is how much in um, in uh, adoration that they 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 kept the the Roman times the idea of the empire the, the Franks were literally obsessed by by their the Roman legacy 
for themselves because they thought it wasn't just something extraneous that they were now recovering. It was actually that they believed that the empire had been translated to them. Uh, I mean, translated, I don't know, it had been... Um, I can't see what's the, the term, but uh, it had been eff effectively shifted, to say, uh, moved, transferred, no, even translated, yeah, translated to them. And therefore they had to emulate the empire. This is how it happened also in the other Renaissance. You know, in the Renaissance it was all about a, a copy of the Greek and Roman time, uh, models. And that's why a bit like the Franks were doing, chiefly from the Western perspective, so mostly looking in Latin culture with Roman um, legacy and um, and um, and therefore copying by it and this Carolingian script was characterized uh, as is as, uh, as it's known um, by uh, very clear uh, characters they were well separated one from the other uh, they were intelligible standardized all what basically very differently from what all the other Romano-Germanic scripts in the West at that time had been. Um, and this is particularly important because this Carolingian script is used at several levels. The highest one which was the uh, writing of documents in the imperial chancery, becoming therefore the script used in all the empire for the public acts. Hmm? So it, this, this was actually issued and, and standardized in, in the rest of the empire. So when in the 15th century actually the humanists that were uh, passion uh, searches as we know of classical works as we've just said found in the, um, the in the libraries of European monasteries the, the, ma the, the books produced in, in Carolingian age they thought themselves that this actually uh, dated back to the Roman age. <laughs> it's kind of ironic because they were searching, you know, with the, their this kind of almost fanatical obsession for Roman times. They these guys found at the end of the, uh, of the Middle Ages these these books that looked so Roman in in, in their script, etc. Instead, they were written in Carolingian times, and therefore they adopted in turn very interestingly this writing, elaborating. Um, eventually this more elegant f uh, version that was known as the Littera Antiqua, so the literally the um, the old character, the old let letter theoretically, um, and, um, and 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 with especially in the dimension of print, of the printing system in the same cent 15th century, um, um, the um, the print would have. Um, fixed and spread everywhere these characters that are the ones that we are still using and therefore they are consistently not the Roman ones but the ones the Carolingians create uh, readapted from the late Roman uh, late Roman manuscripts uh, so this is a bit the story of our of our current script um, so and and if you look at in perspective you realize that um, this is something that started there, so it's not like a tortuous, um, um, you know, road that this script had that kind of popped us to us magically. Basically, from Carolingian times, Europe started writing in a unified with a with a unified script um, that was consistently the same we still use. And even if you look at the so-called Gothic writing, etc., you realize that it, it still comes from that. So what happened in, in, during the Middle Ages was using fundamentally other versions of, of what the Carolingian script were. There were definitely other scripts that kind of survived, but at, this, um, at the end of the day they, they were homogenized. And also because this um, and this system was was useful, was actually used, was actually effective. So there was no reason to keep using you know certain local scripts that were fundamentally understood just locally. It was much easier in a continent that, by the way, was increasingly interconnected to use this new script and its uh, evolutions that, however, remain more or less in the in, in same, in same, within the same model. 
it didn't change substantially. It was like that. Yeah, okay, with the Gothic script, they, you basically it's just a bit, uh, uh, you know, a longer and thinner letter, but it, it's the same Carolingian script. So that when you arrive at uh, Gutenberg, you have, uh, however, the, the same model that that is still there, that is readapted now. Yeah, of course, looking at these older manuscripts, but fundamentally not so different from what had remained in Europe in the Middle Ages as the standard uh, standard script, standard standard writing. And and this, in my opinion, is one of the greatest Carolingian legacies that uh, you know therefore well deserves the time the. Uh, the consideration of uh, uh, one of the you know, greatest Carolingian legacies and a true renaissance, um, uh, symbolizing a true renaissance in culture, because this is the just didn't just correspond to a script to a writing that was conventionally used. This script, this writing, symbolizes actually the homogenization of European um, communication system that was all one. In, uh, in books, in, in the form, in the content of the texts, even in the means of production, in the centers of studying. So behind the script you have actually a system that is pretty much homogeneous all over Europe and even beyond the same Carolingian frontier because this writing starts being used also into uh, the Normans exported uh, into, into Anglo-Saxon England they export it into southern Italy. Um, it, it's been used in, into into northern Spain if, during the Reconquista. Uh, it, it, it expands all over Eastern Europe. Uh, so you have this Latin script that comes to 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 define what the knowledge of the time had to be. And the knowledge of the time was n was not just a knowledge like all the others. Like what is that you fundamentally? do is uh, you just use a, a script? No, it's a view of the world. When you look at these medieval scripts you're not looking at um, just a, a a system of symbols. You're looking at a view of the world, like in those letters there is the the view understanding of the universe, of, 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 of human existence, etc. You can sense that from the same manuscripts. If you ever take in, 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 in your hands a, ma a medieval manuscript, it's, it's beautiful because you really see the the mindset beyond the the strictly material aspect of this, and you look at what these guys thought a knowledge to be, uh, the universe to be. At their and 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 medieval society had this enormous uh, love for knowledge, this enormous thirst for knowledge. Actually, the medieval man is the in history was the the thirstiest thirstiest man of. of, of uh, of knowledge in, in in all a of all ages this is widely overlooked but it was not in the enlightenment it was not in roman times it was in the middle ages that people really looked at knowledge like a real treasure a real need a, a, re a moral duty because effectively knowledge was out there to be to be figured out uh, by divine will hmm? so this is particularly important. So there is a view of the world behind that. And and while the Carolingian Empire fundamentally crumbled, albeit the em the imperial authority remained alive in some way, uh, what you see is that in fact uh, the, one of the major legacies that um, survived universally in this sense. So with a universalistic intent, was the script, was the manuscript production was the centers of studies were the ideas that these people were set. so this in a way saved Europe also in, in the darkest hour the second invasions of all the social political and social conflicts there was this unifying factor that passed also through books through through the love for the classics for the, 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 the religious studies the theological studies and the Carolingians made it to uh, settled this forever because there was no other change fundamentally. It was not in the history of the West a another change in the mean of communication in the means of communication that would fundamentally grow uh, this world uh, dishomogeneous and fragmented once again like it was in pre-Carolingian times. And this was a clamorous su success of the Empire uh, of its ambitions and, and we owe to it a lot. 
because as long as there is a, a functional communication, there can be a, a, a prosperous society, or at least the, the chance of building one in through it. And this is what we're, we, we're all trying to do still. Um, and, and the men of those times thought of these problems and solved these solutions. So when you look at the Middle Ages, where you know ah, such a dark moment, where everywhere everything was dark and weird and crazy and uh, antifunctional, irrational. Well, you have you're still writing today with a medieval script. Just think about it. <laughs> so for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.